Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks to the organizers for the invitation to speak at this meeting. Uh, my graduate student just sent me a, an article from PNAS showing that uh, pr parole approval goes down rapidly right before lunch. So <laughs> with that in mind, um, I'll, I'll try to move quickly through this. A lot of folks have uh, talked about economics, so I'm happy to dive a little bit deeper into that topic and uh, see what we can come up with. Let's see here. Okay, uh, just a little bit of a primer on cost effectiveness, a couple slides so we're on the, all on the same page. Um, why do we do cost effectiveness analysis in healthcare? It's basically because there's not a functioning free market. You know, when you, go, when you go to a cafe, you're the one making the decision about what to buy. You have a pretty good idea of what it's going to taste like. And you're the one that gets the benefits or the harms. In healthcare, none of these things are true. Patient's not the one making the ultimate decision. They don't have full information about all the benefits and harms. And, and oftentimes, they're not the ones paying for it. And that's really why this field of economic evaluation in healthcare um, has seen such rapid growth. Uh, another point is that when, there, there's a lot of technical terms, but when we talk about economic evaluation and cost effectiveness, we are not talking about saving money. I hate to break it to you. We're talking about spending money more efficiently, getting more for the amount of money we spend. Sometimes that may mean you end up spending less money, but our goal is not to decrease the amount of money we spend. Our goal is to improve health with, with a given amount of money that we have available. So that's, a, that's really value is what it's about. And weighing these two things, how much health can we generate with a given amount of money? So we're always, all these economic evaluation approaches essentially take heavy consideration of health benefits, take into consideration epidemiology. Cost just happens to be something we throw in there. So you'll see that more when I go into one of these models that's been published. Um, just one other thing is the metric that's the standard metric in the field is um, a quality. Now we can talk about, we can measure clinical events, we can measure life expectancy, um, but we want to also consider quality of life. And this metric, quality adjusted life year, just combines quality of life with length of life. And that's basically what we produce in healthcare, right? We don't make cars, we don't make battleships. We make length of life and quality of life. We're trying to increase those. So that's why people like the quality. It really is kind of encompasses those. Um, but we also measure these other things too. And then there's a standard metric we use uh, called the incremental cost effectiveness ratio. Again, that's basically how many qualities can you buy for the amount of money you spend. It's kind of like miles per gallon a little bit. And um, a simplified way to think about it is uh, if we look at the uh, cost a, different, a difference in cost between what we're doing now and what we might do in the future, and the difference in effectiveness, which would include both benefit and harm, and just graph that. We can see in this cost effectiveness plane, um, some of it's pretty straightforward. You don't want to hurt people and spend more money. Um, if you can save money and help people, it's obvious you should do that. You don't need an economist to calculate anything. Most of the time, we're in this upper right quadrant where it's going to cost a little bit more money, but we're going to have better outcomes. And that's where we spend most of the time. And Within that um, space, we can talk about uh, the cost effectiveness ratios. And um, Dr. Sung mentioned, you know, like how, how much should we spend to get one year of perfect health? Uh, Dr. Sung mentioned $50,000 for quality, which has been a pretty standard metric. I think in the United States now, it's, it's, it's changed now. People have looked at it a little more closely. It's probably closer to about $100,000 for quality. Uh, World Health Organization says uh, three times per capita GDP. So somewhere around that ballpark allows us to at least say is it, is it might be reasonable value or not. OK, so uh, that was a whole quarter's worth of health, health economics in like five slides. But um, <laughs> just wanted you to have a little bit of a, a uh, laying the foundation there. Um, thinking a little bit about what do payers want, particularly regard into, in regards to genetic testing, um, we've done some, some uh, focus groups and key informant interviews talking to folks about diagnostic tests. and. Um, I think one reaction they have is we've seen a lot of things that are vague, that supposedly can do a lot of things sort of well, but there's not real good data for any of them. And just because you keep adding things to your assay doesn't mean it's better. They like concrete examples. Why do this? What's the clinical action that can be undertaken, and why is that beneficial? We've got that in spades here. I think that's pretty obvious. Um, and then another comment here again around this. Um, this is more related to uh, exome sequencing and incidental findings, but the same concept of 
you know, we want to see good, solid, clean evidence for what you're putting on your test in front of us. Um, and I think they get a, they've been a bit dismayed from some of the things that are, that are presented to them and, and they're asked to pay for. Um, so that might come into our thinking. That obviously influences cost effectiveness, but also is a strategic issue. Um, and this is just to note that when we do economic evaluation, again, I just want to highlight that 80% of the work you do when you do one of these things has nothing to do with cost. It has to do with epidemiology, risk, attributable risk, how much can you improve outcomes. And you actually are doing a risk-benefit calculation, quantifying it, and then you add in costs. So there's actually valuable information that can come out of this, these calculations. Uh, it also provides decision makers with information about their val overall value, and I think really importantly also about uncertainty. Um, and I think those are the three things they've been most receptive to uh, in the settings I've seen in the United States. Important to keep in mind, ec economic data, you should, you know, it's just one piece of information that goes into decision making. So that's really important to, to remember. Just because something's cost effective does not mean you're going to do it for a variety of other reasons uh, that might change your decision. So let's just uh, step through um, uh, this example and think about whether it might be cost effective, kind of in a qualitative sense, um, looking at some of the major factors uh, that could be important. The first is uh, one of the, the most single most important things that can drive value is how frequent the outcome is. Oh, well, in this case, it's not so much working in our favor. Uh, you know, it's one per thousand, one per 400, depending on what you're looking at. Um, you have to, you know, number, need, number needed to test 400. It's not terrible, but it, it's not um, necessarily working in your favor too much, fairly rare. Um, I think the fact that this is such a severe outcome uh, is really important, um, particularly uh, with TENS, with the mortality effects can be really important. And also the long-term sequelae uh, over the lifetime um, uh, can really be important in, in influencing the value here. Um, the other thing to think about is what's your alternative to uh, genetic testing? Well, there are, all, are alternatives. We can completely eliminate carbamazepine-induced Stevens-Johnson syndrome, right? Just get rid of carbamazepine. Um, so you, need, you actually need to think about that. What does that mean? Um, is, that, is that an approach that makes more sense? Um, it's a possibility. There are other drugs out there. And then kind of getting into the, the epidemiology and the, the strength of the association. It's really important here. I think everyone's kind of got the sense of it and mentioned it that you know, in this case, we have an just unbelievable relative risk here with these markers. It's incredible. But it's also, um, you know, what it comes down to is, is the positive predictive value is not that high. Okay? So basically, if, you, if your positive predictive value is in the single digits, 90% of the time, you're going to do something to that patient and they didn't really need it. They didn't need their drug switched. And in other studies we've done in pharmacogenomics, this is, can be a fatal flaw. Because if you're switching to another drug and it's not quite as good or it has a little bit higher side effects, that can quickly swamp out the benefit. So that's something that needs to be considered. And then around cost, um, I think the main thing here, obviously, I don't think there's a whole lot going on. It's mainly around how much is our test going to cost and also uh, something around the treatment of the adverse event. And I'll come back to that in a second. Uh, there are a few other issues here. Um, I mentioned alternative drugs and, and just also Thinking broadly, you know, how do, and I think a couple of people mentioned it, how do other people react to this information, family members, et cetera? And this is, these are probably secondary effects, but something worth, worth thinking about. So um, fortunately, um, there's been some really nice economic evaluations conducted. And uh, Dr. Sung presented their work uh, previously, but I wanted to just dive into that just a little bit more. So this is the study out of Singapore. And um, I didn't pick this study to poke holes in it. I picked this study because I thought it was, it was nicely done. So she looked, Cynthia looked a little nervous there. So <laughs> um, You can't read this. But I just want to show you. We build these decision trees, and we, uh, the authors include a lot of different options. The main thing I wanted to highlight, and Cynthia mentioned it, and that was that they included that option of just giving everybody a different drug with no testing. And that's really important because that, that's a potentially viable alternative. And included a lot of downstream effects, not just adverse events, but efficacy of the drugs, et cetera. So you can see that uh, these can get fairly complicated. 
And then just thinking through some of the inputs, basically, I kind of feel like almost everything every, people have talked about here, all the data, all, the, all of those things get fed into one of these analyses. Okay, so we start out with some of the economic stuff, um, but there's also uh, issues around the fatality, um, the prevalence of, of the genotype, the strength of the association, all of that gets fed into here. Um, important things to consider are the cost of the alternative drug, which uh, may not be real expensive, but is more expensive than um, the drug you start with. Um, the cost of genotyping in this case was uh, $270 US dollars. And then look here at the costs of treatment. I think you can see that I doubt the costs in the US are anywhere close to that. $17,000, that's like per day maybe in a U.S. burn unit, so, um, but, the, you know, the, for, for these, for this analysis, the, those were the relevant costs. And again, uh, population frequency is going to be really, really important. Now, uh, it might take you a sec to get your, thanks, Terry, it might take you a sec to get your head around this uh, slide here, but uh, this is a sensitivity analysis saying what happens if we change some of these parameters? What happens to the cost effectiveness? And on this axis, is positive predictive value, right, which is a function of the association and the prevalence, and then um, uh, the prevalence of the side effect. And here is the uh, frequency of 1502. And you can see that they're highly influential, and you can kind of pick out a spot here in what general region might you be cost effective. And you can see quickly when your frequency of the variant gets low, it, it becomes much more difficult to show that it's cost effective. And I think, you know, analyses like this can very quickly give us a general sense of which populations might it make sense and which populations is it, there's just no way that it makes any economic value sense to do that. And I think this type of thing would be uh, very useful for, for policy making and maybe help inform some of the policies uh, in Singapore. So there's been a, a few other nice studies that have been done, uh, particularly in Thailand, um, looking at both um, uh, carbamazepine as well as allopurinol. Generally found they were cost effective, but uh, in this case, um, because the alternative drug uh, was more expensive, it didn't really pan out that it was highly cost effective. It was kind of a reasonable value, but not a strong economic value. So that's something, again, that's important to consider. Uh, so what about the U.S.? That's easy. I didn't find anything. Informal search, I didn't find anything. It's not real surprising. Uh, a couple of things to think about, just big picture. You know, I think there's about 30 million Asian Americans in the U.S. And I don't know, Josh, if you had a, an estimate how many people are exposed at some point to a drug that might cause the syndrome, but let's just say, what if it was 5% at some time in their life they were exposed? You know, we're talking $300 million, and you could buy a lot of things with $300 million. It's nice cohorts, stuff like that. So it's important to keep that in mind. Um, uh, the, the cost implications could be significant. And even if it represents a good value, it might not be affordable. And then again, I think just in terms of cost effectiveness, really some data on, on prevalent, the incidence of the variant, prevalence of the variant, the risk, um, our costs are likely much higher for the side effect, but the cost of alternative drugs uh, might also be higher. So I think those are all things that would have to be considered for the U.S. So looking at payer policy, I just grabbed these off the web last night, Anthem, a uh, very large insurance company in the U.S. And um, you can see here that um, for carbamazepine, that may, carbamazepine, they say that it is medically necessary. If they're of Asian descent, and it's kind of a catchphrase, if there are no other alternatives to carbamazepine. So I don't quite know how you interpret that, but interpretation might be that, well, there's quite a few alternatives, so you don't need to test. But they're definitely open to the idea, and it, I think they're kind of following along, I would think, the, the evidence and the FDA labeling. And then here, then here from Aetna, just pointed out some other testing, CYP2C19, um, uh, I don't know if I, I kind of messed up the pasting here, but for CYP2C19 for clopidogrel, they gave that a thumbs up. Alan, you'd be happy to hear. Uh, they said they pay for that, but they say they won't pay for warfarin, okay? So they are looking at the data. They are looking at the evidence. They're making decisions. Um, uh, but they do consider this medically necessary for carbamazepine. So 
I mean, I'm not seeing real strong signals that payers are putting up an absolute roadblock here to paying for these types of things, and I think that's important. So some things to think about. Um, you know, we need the number one thing I would say is for, for the economics is epidemiology in the U.S., kind of what, what do things look like. Um, I think the second thing is understanding how patients and clinicians respond to testing. Do they just start avoiding, avoiding the drug altogether? Because I think that would be a general loss to society. Um, and that might be able to, you could probably do that with a study of several hundred up to maybe a thousand people where you, you test them and see what they do. Uh, I think keeping testing simple and sticking with the best evidence is probably a good idea. Uh, thinking outside the box, how do we get an, a, a cheap, fast test testing platform in global health, doing things like economic prizes for developing such a thing uh, where there's not market incentives to do, enough market incentive to do so. Um, I have a few slides on value of information analysis, which is a, an, a new approach health econom economists are using to put a monetary value on conducting generally large investments, large studies. Um, we've done some work in cancer genomics uh, with SWOG, looking at, at different applications. Um, I think the only thing I'll point out is that you can get big differences. In this case, uh, our work directed them away from EGFR more towards breast cancer tumor markers. I think the other thing I'd like to point out is that you know, these, these numbers up here are in the billions of dollars in terms of societal value generated by a study that, you know, might be $20 million. So we're looking at return on investments that can range from 10 times to 100 times the investment. I think the interesting point here is that it's a fairly rare occurrence, but yet I think there's still tremendous value, so it might be interesting to look at that. And that you could also use this for trial design. So in summary, um, I think it's, there's pretty nice evidence um, from the studies that have been published that um, testing can provide good economic value. Uh, I think clearly needs some evidence in the United States before we can make that type of assessment, particularly looking at uh, subgroups, type, different types of patients. And um, we need to be cognizant of overall budget impact and real world policy considerations uh, when we're looking at that. So thanks, I'd be happy to take any questions. Questions? Yes, is there a um, NNT number that you use in economics to say that's that's um, you know a right number to allow uh, to go ahead with the intervention? Yeah, the question is: Is there a right number needed to treat or number needed to test? Is, there's, is there a threshold? And the answer is no, because it really depends on what the con the cost consequences are and the health outcome consequences are. So it really is a case-by-case -case basis. But I think it matters for budget impact. Right. Uh, One of the issues that comes up is the question of research. So you have a potential candidate marker, but you don't know enough about it yet. And you might discover in the future, if you have enough study in a healthcare system outcome platform, that a certain subset actually meets the criteria. So how do you leverage the uh, research money in the context of actually getting these studies done to, to know the answer. It's a little bit of the horse and cart problem because if you require the stringency of utility before you even study it, you'll never get the study done. And this is a, you know, I, in cancer research, this is a big issue. Yeah. People are getting now genotypes for everything, for every gene that they know about, but that's a research tool, really. Yeah, it's a great question, and I think it's possible to think about a situation where maybe you have an assay that has, you know, one or two or three things on it that you're, you're, you're sure about, but maybe has some research um, pieces to it also that's maybe not part of the intervention. It's not returned to the patient, but it's utilized for research purposes. And that way, I think it's easier to get the buy-in from healthcare systems, clinicians, et cetera, um, but is an extremely cost-effective way to, to combine implementation research with more uh, applied basic research. Yeah. yeah um, oh, so, I'm sorry, Mike, go ahead. David, so, um, you know, in the UK, we've got something called NICE. Um, and uh, um, when you have a rare disease, the kind of thresholds that you use for cost effectiveness are completely different, are not used in the same way as thresholds for more common therapeutics in common diseases. So here we have an adverse drug reaction such as SJS, TEN, which is rare. It is a rare disease. So why should we be using the same thresholds that we would use for common diseases for something so rare? 
I think the short answer is probably that we shouldn't. Uh, my guess, you know, so NICE is a technology assessment group, and they're pretty strict, but they make exceptions, um, uh, as Meneer indicates. And my guess is that in the United States, that people have a higher threshold for something like this. Um, and so, uh, you know, potentially you would be looking at, an, you know, going above 100,000, still being reasonable. Um, it's not clear where that line might be, but I do think this is a special case. Um, yeah, this goes back to the question that Mark raised, and, and uh, one of the things that we found useful in terms of using uh, economic uh, analytic tools and decision modeling when there's uncertainty is that the sensitivity analysis can identify which unknowns have the biggest impact in terms of the results of the model. And so in some sense, when you have a whole list of questions that you could invest research dollars in, uh, by understanding which one of those has the biggest impact in terms of the answer that you're looking for, it can actually direct you to say we should do this study and not that study. Uh, and that seems to be useful. Yeah, I'd agree. And a lot of times those analyses can allay decision maker, policy makers' fears. They sometimes will get hung up on a, one certain aspect of the, de, of the policy and you can show them that, well, actually it doesn't have a big impact. Let's focus on something else. 